This is the estimated contribution from all sources and sinks. The human source is of order 5 gigatons per year. By comparison, the ocean emits of order 90. Land emits another 60. Total emission from native sources is thus of order 150 gigatons per year. 96% of the total. It's approximately balanced by native sinks, which absorb about as much. The key word, approximately. Because native sources and sinks are two orders of magnitude stronger, even a minor imbalance can overshadow the human source. Moreover, if those sources involve carbon-13 leaner than in the atmosphere, as many do, all bets are off. This is the global distribution of CO2 only recently available from satellites like Saimaki. Even these modern observations are limited to continents, but that's where the human source is. Large values in yellow and red are a signature of source regions. Notice they're not found in the industrialized centers, the Ohio River Valley of the US, or Western Europe, or even China, rather, they appear in the Amazon Basin, tropical Africa, and Southeast Asia. Those regions have little human population, let alone industrialization. What I really want you to notice is that even in those source regions, CO2 deviates from its global mean by less than 5%. Local values of CO2 are therefore a good approximation to its global mean, which in turn provides the history of net global emission. The IPCC has proclaimed the following. All of the increase in CO2 since pre-industrial times is caused by human activity. The increased CO2 is known to be caused by human activity because the character of CO2 in the atmosphere, the ratio of its heavy to light carbon atoms, has changed in a way that can be attributed to addition of fossil fuel carbon. The observed sensitivity of native emission of CO2 and carbon-13 make this impossible. And that brings us lastly to how all of this shakes out in the world of climate models. Plotted here is global mean temperature from CRU. The end of the 20th century is warmer than the beginning by just under a degree. But it's hardly a consequence of steady warming. Rather, it results from consecutive decades of warming being incompletely canceled by consecutive decades of cooling. The difference in global temperature results almost entirely from just two intervals. Two decades during the Depression era and two at the close of the century. Less than 30% of the record. And to be rhetorical, those are the only intervals when temperature has a trend of even the same sign as the trend of CO2. Since 1997, global temperature has experienced no warming. If anything, it's experienced gradual cooling Global temperature is the most fundamental climate property, the one on which others rest. It's the cornerstone of climate change. If anything's going to carry the signature of increasing CO2, it will. After all, climate models reproduced its previously observed warming during the 80s and 90s. That led many of us to speculate, well, maybe they are getting it. But reproducing the known change in global temperature is 2020 hindsight. It's not a strong test of predictive skill. That experiment is called a hindcast. The real test is a forecast, predicting future evolution. Only then can one be confident that models haven't been tuned to match observed behavior. That's tantamount to a double-blind test. The standard of rigor 
required in clinical trials of pharmaceuticals. Neither the patient, here the model, nor the clinician, the guy running the model, then knows the outcome. In blue is the forecast evolution of global temperature, averaged over two dozen models of the IPCC. The mean evolution is free of decadal variability which must therefore be incoherent between the models. It follows that on those time scales, the models have no predictive skill. Notice, this is the same time scale responsible for almost all of the 20th century warming. The only feature common to the models retained in their mean is a centennial drift. It increases monotonically, becoming three and a half Kelvin warmer by the end of the 21st century. The increase of global temperature should correspond to increasing CO2. In fact, their correspondence is considerably greater. In green is the forecast evolution of CO2. It too increases, exceeding 800 ppmv by the end of the century. Global temperature doesn't just increase with increasing CO2. It tracks it almost perfectly. In the model world, changes of global temperature and CO2 are isomorphic. They have exactly the same form. Their relationship is so tight, you don't even need a climate model. A fractional increase of CO2 entirely determines the fractional increase of global temperature. The simulated relationship is remarkable. Here's why. Remember the global energy budget? It is what determines global temperature. Increased CO2 contributes to the energy budget, but only at the 1% level. The one-to-one -one correspondence indicates that changes of global temperature remain in equilibrium with changes of CO2, but nothing else. Dominant contributions to the energy budget either do not change, or if they do, they are enslaved to CO2. Those contributions can change only in direct proportion to CO2, which in the model world controls everything. Reflected shortwave energy, which depends on cloud and ice, can't change independently. Mechanical heat transfer from the Earth's surface, which depends on the ocean circulation, can't change independently. And 99% of the long wave energy absorbed by the atmosphere and re-emitted back downward to warm the Earth's surface, which depends on water vapor and cloud, can't change independently. In the model world, that is, the part that is consistent between all those two dozen models, changes in the global energy budget reduced to a highly simplified balance, driven exclusively by CO2. This means that 1% of the global energy budget wags the other 99%. In blue is the observed record of global temperature from the satellite MSU. In green, the observed record of CO2. The long-term evolution of global temperature parallels that of CO2 during the 1980s. It's been scaled to match the trend then, as was obtained by models of the IPCC. With the count of the eruption of Pinatubo in 1992, their correspondence is similar during the 1990s. But after the El Nino of 1997, CO2 continued to increase. Global temperature did not. Their divergence over the last decade and a half is now unequivocal. In the model world, global temperature tracks CO2 almost perfectly. In the real world, it clearly doesn't. Model world, real world. This leads to the following conclusion. In the model world, changes of CO2 and global temperature are closely related. In fact, to within a scale factor, 
The two are synonymous. They are synonyms for the same thing. In the real world, they're not related. Not quite. The correct conclusion is they're not related directly, as they are under the simplified energy balance that prevails in the model world. Recall, on timescales shorter than a century, changes of CO2 are conservative, controlled by emission from native sources. CO2 then evolves, not like temperature, as it does in the model world, but like the integral of temperature. In dotted blue is the integral of observed temperature. It closely tracks observed CO2, even after the 1990s, when the observed records of CO2 and temperature clearly diverged. If CO2 tracks the integral of temperature, which it clearly does, it cannot track temperature, which it clearly doesn't. In the model world, CO2 and global temperature are related directly. In the real world, they're also related, but differently. The distinctly different relationship between CO2 and global temperature represents a fundamental difference in the global energy balance between its evolution in the model world and the real world. If the global energy balance is wrong, everything else is window dressing. The different relationship between CO2 and global temperature becomes manifest after the 1990s when their observed records diverged. But once the temperature dependence of CO2 emission is accounted for, namely by native sources, the two observed records are entirely consistent. These features of the observed evolution have the following two-pronged implication. In the real world, global temperature is not controlled exclusively by CO2, not even on long time scales as it is in the model world. In significant part, however, CO2 is controlled by global temperature. As it is in the proxy record. I'll close with a retrospective of general significance. The science is settled. How often have you heard that? <clears throat> Meet Richard Feynman, described as the greatest mind since Einstein. I had occasion to meet Feynman during my brief time at Caltech. And it was then that he gave a commencement address, wherein he spoke on science, pseudoscience, and how not to fool yourself. He noted, one can be easily deceived by deferring to the authority of supposed experts. Feynman developed a paradigm of such behavior, which he characterized as cult science. Feynman also discussed the key to science. Different audience, but the same thing. Here's an excerpt. Now I'm going to describe how we would look for a new physical law. We do so through the following process. First, we guess. The audience breaks up in laughter. No, don't laugh. It's true. Then we perform a calculation to see what are the implications of the guess. And then we compare the result directly with observations. If it disagrees, it's wrong. And that statement is the key to science. It doesn't matter how beautiful your guess is. It doesn't matter who made the guess or what his name is. If it disagrees with observations, it's wrong. That's all there is to it.